It's 1982, E.T. is in the cinemas, Italy wins the World Cup. Porsche, Ferrari and Lotus seem untouchable when it comes to sports cars. In the USA, the Datsun Z has made big inroads. However, in Europe, with our colossal arrogance, we're still not taking Japanese cars seriously. They're just cheap, inferior copies of our own cars. This is when this car was released known as the Celica Supra or the Celica XX in Japan. Now we know that eventually the Europeans did take the Japanese seriously, but was this car already good enough to threaten their hegemony or was it not quite there yet? Let's find out. Now the Celica got off to a very good start because in 1984, in a car and driver comparison of a series of sports car, it came out as better handling than a Porsche 911 928, than a Ferrari 328, and even than a Lotus Esprit. Now, I have to say I'm a little bit dubious, especially about the Esprit, because Esprits at that time really were amazing handling cars, but I guess we will find out a bit more about that shortly. Firstly, a little bit of background. Now, Toyota had seen the success of Nissan's Z cars. They wanted to replicate it. The only thing was, by the time they started, it was sort of like the late 70s, I suppose. So the Z itself, with the 280 had got a bit flabby, a bit fat, a bit soft. And Toyota already had the Celica and they thought they'd take a shortcut. So rather than design a car from the ground up or the Mark I Supra, the car that came before this, they simply went on to lengthen the front of the car and squeeze in a six cylinder engine. It didn't handle very well. It had a solid rear axle. It was underpowered with just 110 horsepower. For the Mark II though, they made a bit more of an effort. Now this is still based on the original Celica, so from the B-pillar back, it is the same car, but there are some important differences. This is obviously longer, wider to accommodate the six cylinder engine, which is now putting out much more power. This has, unlike the Celica, independent rear suspension. So it has struts at the front and then a semi-trailing arm set up at the rear. When it came out, this was a bit more expensive than a base Porsche 924. But for that money, you obviously got the six cylinder engine rather than the four cylinder in the 924 and a lot more standard equipment like electric windows, sunroof, cruise control, and so on. So overall, it was still really good value. The engine was the 5MGE. It's an iron block, inline six cylinder, twin overhead cam 12 valve putting out in the European versions about 170 horsepower. Now I had read that the steering although assisted felt quite heavy at speeds compared to the more modern stuff. I have to say on this particular car to me it feels, it doesn't feel that heavy at all. I think it's got a really nice positive movement to it. It's very keen to turn in. Uh, maybe it's not quite as feelsome as some of the best systems of this time, but I'd say the weighing and the speed is pretty spot on. It's all about the engine though, so let's just do a quick pull through the gears and see how it feels. It's not a beast in terms of power, uh, but it is ever so smooth in the mid-range from three to about five and a half. It roughens up a really a tiny bit at the top, but also the engine note changes around 5,000 RPMs. It sounds a little bit meaner, a little bit rougher. And 
it's a fairly well balanced car but on the tighter corners you can see there there's a fair amount of lean now the trade-off for that is that at normal speeds when you're driving it normally it's actually very very comfortable um, but although maybe it has the makings of a good car in terms of out and out performance in terms of out and out handling there's that keen steering but i think that driven properly hard the suspension is just too soft to call this a proper sports car now kai who owns this also has a 944 turbo and these were supposed to be competitors at the time but i agree with him they are very different this feels more like a spirited gt the 944 is a proper all-out sports car As you drive it longer, I think that that engine also gets under your skin a bit. It's just the lovely mid-range, the low-end torque and the little growl at lower revs when you put your foot down. Um, it's very addictive. I mean, it goes up to close to seven, but I think that between sort of three and five and a half, six is really the sweet spot for me. When they were first released in America, they had two options. They had the Type L, which was the luxury version, and that had smaller wheels, a less sort of uh, flaunty body kit, and the digital instrumentation, and an auto gearbox. Yuck. The Type, uh, the type P for performance had flared archers, bigger wheels, limited slip diff, manual gearbox and in America it had analog uh, dials for the dash. In the UK we got a kind of mixture of the best of it really so I think these got the sports seats in America the performance had sports seats as well I don't know if I mentioned that but also we got the limited slip diff, the wider wheels, the more aggressive body kit that was the only version that was sold. The dash is incredibly charming now of course um, with the way the revs go, which mirrors the torque curve as well, is very clever. But an analog dash is really far superior to this for everyday use. In a classic, this is charming. If you had this on the day, once you got over the novelty of having such a high-tech solution, I think that that would have worn off quite quickly and you would have preferred the traditional dash. All the plastics, although unremarkable, they're all good quality and the switch gear is lovely. You've got some sort of, I wouldn't, shiny makes it sound cheap, it's not that, but the plastics look nice. They're nicely printed, they feel nice to use, the switch gear is very nice. They have these two very interesting, very strange little tumblers on each side. This for the wipers and this for the cruise control which apparently still works. Everything, incidentally, on this car is still working. There was one thing Kai told me which doesn't work. Oh, the heated rear screen is the only thing. Everything else works perfectly. The seats are really, really comfortable and they hold you in place really well. The sort of Vela upholstery helps with that because it's not as slippery as a leather would be. The heating controls are all very simple. The movement is nice. Again, it just feels like a, you know, a vehicle which has been well built. The gearbox has got a really nice action to it. It's quite a long throw. It's a long lever as well. They could have used a shorter lever. There's a little bit of notchy there. It's not a system which you would want to rush, but it's really nice and mechanical in feel. So my premise at the beginning of this video was that basically the Japanese are coming, are we ready for it? And was this just a salvo? Or was it, although it maybe it didn't sell in huge numbers in Europe, was that because we were just kind of stuck up Europeans? Or was it because maybe this wasn't quite there yet, quite good enough? From my experience today, I think that as a car, this is great. Now I think that they look really nice they've got a lot of a muscle car feel muscle car look to them they are taut to me it does rival some of the better european designs the back end isn't quite as good i think as the front end of the car but 
Overall, I think it's a really striking, distinctive car. So in terms of looks, yes, brilliant. In terms of quality, of course, great. You know, these are cars that always did very well. They didn't go wrong. Um, the interiors were well put together. Um, and this has the extra flash of that digital dash for a bit more drama as well. It has that ability to go down a bumpy road and at least up to six or seven tenths it handles it admirably. It flows down the road. The wheels are kept in touch at all times. You're not, you know, it's not uncomfortable. It doesn't transmit too much of the bumps, all that kind of stuff. The engine works with the rest of the car, I think, because it has a good, good torque to it. Low down, a nice mid-range, and you can rev it. It's very smooth. I found that really, once it goes past five, you get the added growl maybe as it comes on cam, and after that, there's no point completely wringing its neck. So it comes across as a more relaxed proposition than some of those cars that it was compared against. Perhaps a 928, like a Mini 928 of the European cars, is the best comparison. So it's not an out-and-out -out sports car, and it's difficult then to judge it against its European competition of the time. In many ways, I think it was better and I love this car, but it doesn't really excite me in terms of outright handling. It's got that keen turn in, which is nice. Um, but apart from that, it's not really a car to be driven properly hard. Perhaps in the US where they had different priorities, that didn't really matter so much. The other thing we have to bear in mind is that it's now very difficult to get tires, proper tires that fit these sizes. So. Kai had to compromise and he got some BF Goodrich. They were the only ones that fit. It's quite an old design. He isn't a fan, mind you. He's a long time go-kart racer, so he's obviously very handy. He was saying that on the Autobahn, it was a bit scary. On the evidence of what I found today driving it, I think that it's not a super precise car anyway, and the suspension is quite soft. So I'm not sure how much the tires would really benefit this. I'm not sure the chassis is is up there really to deal with a grippier, better performing tyre. But for sure it doesn't help that they are such an old design. Now if you want to buy one of these today you would have a little bit of a job because I had a look last night and in the UK I can't find any. I had a look in the US and they seem to vary sort of between sort of ten to thirty thousand dollars something along those lines and Kai told me that he he reckons that for a good one you'd be looking at thirty thousand pounds you can get cars maybe that need a little bit of attention or a little bit rough around the edges for sort of ten fifteen twenty thousand but yeah such a rare thing that it's quite hard to price it now huge thanks to Kai for bringing this down today if you have another car that you'd like me to do a review on, please do get in touch. I think some of the MR2s, the Mark 1, Mark 2, well all of them really, I think I've done a Mark 3, but some of the MR2s would be good, any of the other Toyota sports cars, cars of the time, I'd be really interested in doing. Thank you so much for watching and I really look forward to seeing you for the next video.